in the previous video, one of the things I mentioned that was that one of the shortcomings of the popularization of yoga, at least the yoga that helped to grow its popularity, let's put it that way, really did not include much as it relates to self-regulation. And moreover, it really didn't include some of the most essential teachings about asana practice. Now, I kind of made a wholesale statement. It's not entirely true. For instance, yin yoga, there's a long, there's a long holding process within yo yin yoga. It's a key characteristic of that approach. And of course, restorative yoga. Uh, but let's, let's try and talk a little bit about it. Th these two terms, sukham and stiram, they, I mean, you don't have to study yoga for very long before you come up, up to them. So sukham means comfort or ease. The roots of the word are su meaning good, ka meaning space. So imagine then the sense of opening ourselves to the experience of good space, ease, comfort. Stidam is stability. It refers to an idea of the motionlessness, steadiness, steadiness. But the idea of sukha, excuse me, of stidam is really, is, it's a profound idea. In essence, and as I began to describe in the previous video, I mean, we're always meeting something in the moment. It might be a, a wonderful situation. It might be less than a wonderful situation. We have to meet the moment. And as we go, particularly as we transition from one kind of experience to a different kind of experience, there's naturally a, a period of destabilization. Life in your home, apartment, to the car, to traffic, to work, to the relationship from work to maybe relating to your children. All of those, every, every experience that's distinct in that way can be a transition and somewhat destabilizing. But destabilizing, we have to also understand, is a multi-layered process that we become destabilized on many levels. And depending on our adaptability, which I spoke about just previously, the idea here is to watch the extent to which there's a chain reaction of instability. So if I encounter something mentally, emotionally, very quickly, almost instantly actually, there's a shift in my breath. Now, if that breath is sustained, if let's say I feel some tension or fear and now my breath is sustained, uh, in a, in, uh, is sustains or incurs that shift like from ease to fear and it's sustained long enough, then my blood pressure will rise, my heart rate will go up, I'll begin to shift into my sympathetic nervous system, my blood flow will start to move away from my internal organs, all the things we know about the autonomic nervous system. But the point is it's that chain reaction that happens. That defines instability as much as the instant that we experienced a transition that took us out of our steadiness. So it's like our unsteadiness then ripples outward and affects us in many ways. So stability means not just what's conscious, but really to what extent are we unstabilized by transitions moment to moment to moment? Remember, again, as we move into this practice, remember this idea that your body is your physical memory. Everything, every action, every thought, everything you eat, is recorded by the body, some super harmonious. One of the reasons we study Ayurveda is to understand, really, given the time of the year and our type and what we're going through and what's, what's on the rise, what are the conditions in our life, we adjust our diet. So our diet, our thoughts, our lifestyle, all our actions are recorded by the body. Now, one of the things that the Yoga Sutra tells us 
is that every object in the world, every object that can be perceived, has the quality of either stability, but when stability becomes excessive, it becomes what? Inertia, stagnation. Or the second quality is activity, but when activity becomes sustained, uninterrupted, it eventually leads to imbalance, or can have the quality of illumination and ease and clarity. So you've got those three. Stability, which leads to inertia, activity, which leads to imbalance, or the quality of ease, clarity, and illumination, understanding, right knowledge. Tamas, Rajas, Sattva, the three gunas, literally mean that which, the word guna means that which binds us. Every object that we encounter in the world, every food we eat, every friend, every relationship, every movie, everything is impacting us. And remember, unless we're conscious, super conscious, there will be a destabilization such that there's a ripple effect of that guna into the body, into the mind, into the field of emotions. So now about this practice, maybe that's more than you thought I would talk about as we move into a semi-restorative slash supportive practice. It's not a purely uh, restorative practice because I'm actually making... Uh, some of these poses that we'll do and the way that we'll do them, part of the aim of it is to actually be somewhat provocative. A purely restorative practice has no provocation in it. And I'll tell you why. And I'll tell you how we'll practice. And, and all of this I talk about in the practice, but I just want to perhaps offer it to you. So in this conversation of the gunas, what the longer holds do, which is what we're doing. We're doing two things. One is we're creating this opportunity for, the for us to use our mind in order to create more sukham, and not just sukham at the level of mind, but at the level of the sub, and perhaps even unconscious. We want to create more sattva guna, more of that ease and freedom and um, uh, illumination, the illuminative mind, so that we can more completely meet the moment. We can ultimately achieve greater sense of clarity. At the same time, we're also finding a balance and creating greater fluidity between our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the ripple effect of the gunas is such that I may well be holding inertia or stagnation in my lower back, hamstring. And this is arbitrary, by the way. I'm just throwing out some examples. It could be vice versa. You could have rajas in your hamstrings, rajas in the front of your thighs. It means that we use the longer holes to bring the mind to the area of the body that's most affected by the pose. We then regulate the breath and then use the mind, use our attention to become sensitive, sensitized, aware of those sensations that are triggered by the pose. Those sensations then we begin to perceive and we guide our relaxation and our awareness. What are we guiding there? You're guiding sattva guna. You're guiding clarity, ease, illumination, freedom to the body part most affected by the pose. And then there becomes this other element where eventually we bring deep sense of sukham, the deepest sense of ease where the mind melts into the space where there was holding as it releases. The description is that there is intelligence in that space. So in my neck and shoulders, when it's constricted, I don't have access to that intelligence. This helps us lift us into a different relationship to the body, once again, greater autonomy. And as that body space opens and becomes more autonomous, 
it begins to shine with its own unique intelligence, enhancing intuition, sensitivity, clarity. Eventually, the mind melts into that space of intelligence as well as the space outside of us to fully experience succumb. Now, you can't follow that strategy I just described if your breathing is not smooth. There is no such thing as effortlessness, accessing the quality of spaciousness I just described, if the breath is not even and continuous. So throughout this practice, generally speaking, longer holds. Some are going to be more passive than others. But as we hold poses longer and as we regulate the breath one-to-one, gradually it kicks up, it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. And as a result, as the parasympathetic nervous system comes on, the muscles soften, and then we begin to cultivate this deep sense of spaciousness and openness. And also at the same time, increasing our capacity to release the patterns of instability that may be in your breath, that may be in the mind, that may be in a particular body part that have become uh, under the influence or shaped by either tamasguna, inertia, overt stability, or overactivity and balance. So that's what this practice is really all about. I briefly suggested that, you know, for year, for two decades or more, I resisted practices that required props that were restorative in nature. My, tant- my, ver- my tantric teachers really, ins- they got me very inspired. And in my 20s and 30s, I was super fired up to do, you know, navel-centered practices, heart-based practices, strong back bends and inversions, and, and then practices that would light up my chakras and things like that. Then I had twin boys, and then I became a single father to twin boys. They were 14 months old, and after about, well, it took less than a year, raising twin boys by myself, still working full-time. Uh, and by the way, just you may not know if you're not raised twins, but they're on different schedules. They poop at different times. They sleep at different times. They wake up, and literally I was waking up in the middle of the night changing diapers sometimes two, three times. It brought me to my knees. I eventually sought out uh, a master Iyengar teacher, and we talked about the practice. And this practice really is inspired by the knowledge that she gave me, for which I'll always be grateful. It changed my whole perception of things, and within really a matter of weeks, some of the adrenal fatigue that I had. And by the way, I've raised two sets of twins, so if I still have bags under my eyes, it's, it's, uh, the kids have a lot to do with it as I'm sure many of you can identify. So um, here's this practice. Um, So this is the antithesis of my wanting to not practice with no props. It's actually got some props. In fact, I recommend any or all of the following. Uh, You'll see that I'm gonna use blankets, a bolster, a block, a strap, and uh, even a chair. Um, you're, you know, and even a meditation cushion, I think, is in there. So you can work with any and all of those. And um, once you maybe have gone through the practice once, you, you'll know, uh, you'll find your ways to adapt if you don't have all those props. But by all means, you'll be able to do most of it without, without any issues. Listen, the last thing I just want to say before we start the practice is the reality is that my general way of uh, designing practices using Krishmacharya's approach of dynamic in and out of the pose, very strengthening for the lower back. Some people actually, when they initially do it, because there's, they may be flexible but not strong, or that strength, flexibility, balance is not ideal, they'll actually find it's irritating or challenging to their lower back. Their lower back fatigues a lot. That's understandable. I get it. Um, so, but that is one of the key features as we'll break down after the practice. It's one of the key features of what I 
think is, is, is what, how we should be conditioning our body through our yoga practice. However, this practice does not focus on that at all. In fact, it, in, it involves, it consists of a lot of forward bending. The forward bending is utilized in this, in this context because it is so impactful and beneficial and directly impacts your parasympathetic nervous system. It activates it, helps you le lean into relaxation. So keep this in mind. Those of you who have instability in your lower back or if you're over flexible or if you have a tendency to round your back, should you do this practice too much, it might actually irritate the back. So please be gentle, thoughtful. It's, I, I'm telling you, you could do the essential bhav, the way I lead the actual context of the practice, the things I ask you to think about, which I just outlined. The more you bring that to the practice, it almost, you know, the postures are almost secondary. In other words, the way you use your mind is primary. So um, that's really all I have to offer. I, I, I just want to, again, frame the idea that we're going to lean into, the, into affecting our autonomic nervous system because, in general, it has so much impact on these other elements, including the different operative parts of the brain, Listen, your prefrontal cortex doesn't even come online until you relax. We need a level of relaxation. If we're in our fear, our anger, our stress, higher modes of thinking, uh, adaptive thinking, is actually won't come online. We need relaxation for that to happen. And furthermore, for all of these really juicy, extraordinary, inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters, the ones that make us feel good, the ones that help us cope with stress, the ones that um, lead to feelings of love and autonomy and happiness, um, the ones that uh, increase um, our endorphins, make us more resilient to pain. All of these things are hard to control. They're more general in a sense. Diet, generally exercise, by the way, aerobics. Aerobic exercise is vital and, uh, and deep rest. But what we can say are both about the parts of the brains that parts of the brain that we want to work to help us adapt ideally to the moment and the neurotransmitters all come online in a more optimal way when we relax. So that's the nature of what this practice is. It's what it emphasizes. So please enjoy it. I can tell you if you have difficulty sleeping, if you have some of the symptoms of an underactive parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, this practice is extraordinary. And within just a few days, you will begin to feel really deep and meaningful effects from it. Enjoy it, and I'll see you on the other side.